Hey guys, what's going on? IAQ Josh here, and I was super pumped to be introducing you all to my very first DIY mold remediation video. However, through the filming of said video, the project kind of took a turn for the worst. Now, rather than just scrap all of what I consider this to be gold footage, I decided that this video could still be a great educational piece for a lot of the DIY consumers out there. Now be sure to check out the end of this video where I'll meet you right back here in this chair and we can discuss the project as a whole, the unforeseens, what maybe could have been done a little bit better and hopefully better prepare you for possibly an upcoming DIY project or maybe even talk you out of doing it yourself. So let's get started. All right guys, so to kick things off, let's talk a little bit about mold remediation, what it is, what it isn't. So first and foremost, mold remediation is going to be the removal of mold impacted materials, as well as the proper cleaning and treatment techniques following the removal of the source materials. So now there's a distinction to be made when we're talking about something that I would consider a DIY level mold remediation service, and then a professional mold remediation service. So there are many sources out there, including the state of Florida's, that states that anything over 10 square feet requires professional mold remediation. So in reality, determining first and foremost whether or not this is a do-it-yourself project is going to be the most important. What I would encourage you to do is to reach out to a couple of professional mold remediation companies within your area maybe have them come out. A lot of these companies are offering complimentary estimates, as well as in reality, a lot of the questions could be answered by a simple phone call into one of these offices. One additional consideration for assisting to identify whether or not this project would be a good candidate for a DIY approach versus one that would require the hiring of a professional remediation company would be to hire yourself a professional licensed, if your state does require licensure, but professional mold assessment company or contractor. Now a company like this would come out and what their firm would do would perform everything from a visual inspection of the area, again, looking down low at that wall that we saw. They would probably even go as far as collecting a surface sample of that suspect growth that we saw there at the base of the wall. And what they would also do is they would more than likely collect some air samples. These are going to be the spore trap samples that you guys have probably heard me talk about in some of my other videos. And this is gonna provide us with that analytical or what I consider to be subjective data when it comes to what mold is present in the air as well as the quantities. So quite frankly, if you were to hire a professional assessment firm to come out and they were to perform their service and the resulting factor would be elevations in mold within your indoor air quality, that would be the number one sign that this is not something that you should take on yourself, stop what you're doing and call a professional. So now once we determine if this is something small scale enough to where you could tackle it yourself, then that's when we really get into the steps that I'm gonna go over in this video. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the background on what's going on here. So our concern first and foremost is going to be down low there next to the toilet. We've got some water damage. We've also got a little bit of what looks to be efflorescence coming out of the grout lines down by the tile on the baseboard. So the background information here is is we've obviously got some level of a moisture source that is creating these visible damages to us. Now, taking a look around, we can see that the damage is not very widespread. It looks to be isolated just behind the toilet area there. On the back side of this wall, we've got a walk-in closet, which I've inspected myself, don't see anything. Even looking at these nearby caulk lines and caulk joints, we can see there's not a whole lot of water damage. So this project or this specific area that requires remediation looks to be relatively small scale. All right, so the first step when it comes to preparing for any mold remediation service, whether it's a DIY or a professional service, is gonna be relocating all of these lovely personal belongings outside of your immediate work area. In this case, over my shoulder, you can see we've got shampoo bottles, conditioner bottles, 
body washes. We've also got some uh, hand towels down here. So before we do anything, as I say, before the hammers get swinging, we want to carefully and methodically relocate all of the contents within this bathroom outside of our area. In this case, we're gonna take a nearby bedroom and just stack everything up in the corner. All right, so even when you think you've unloaded and relocated everything, hmm, gotta make sure we are paying attention to the belongings that may be inside of here. In this case, we've still got contents. So we have two options. We can either relocate everything out of these cabinets or we could reach to a trusty roll of blue tape and go ahead and seal these puppies up. And just like that, we've minimized the potential for all of this dust that's gonna come from the demolition process getting into this cabinet here. So again, just one of the time-saving tips of the trade to help you to make this a little less intense. All right, so now we're gonna be removing the door. One important thing to keep in mind when you are removing the screws from any hinges, especially if they've been painted over time and time again, you wanna make sure, we've always heard the saying, slow and steady want to be exactly that nice and slow and steady so that way we don't strip out these heads and she is free now a pro tip all of the screws that you just took out here if you want to make sure you don't lose them not that i've ever lost any over the years you can go ahead and proactively screw these back into that door that's sitting off to the side. That way when you're ready to reinstall the door, you're ready to go. All right guys, so now let's talk about the containment setup. And if you follow me on down here, we're gonna talk about some of the tools and materials that we'll need for this next step. Uh, we're gonna need a 12 by 12 filter. The better the filtration level, the better. We're gonna need a zipper. Doesn't matter if it's red, blue, purple, yellow, but just a good solid zipper. A roll of blue painter's tape, a razor knife, as well as a roll of 10 by 100 or realistically any size, six mil thickness is what we're gonna want here. Now, the great thing is all of these are readily available at your local hardware store, so you shouldn't have any trouble finding them. All right, so now when setting up the containment barrier, which is gonna be this plastic sheeting, we're gonna want to go to the opposite side of where our suction's gonna be. So to put it in its most layman sense, we're gonna have our workspace under negative pressure, which means everything outside of our workspace is gonna to wanna to push in. So rather than tape the plastic to the inside of the door frame, where in reality, if you have enough suction, it's just gonna pull down, we wanna tape this to the outside of the door frame. So that's what we're gonna do now. So now a quick pro tip, it's better to cut a little more plastic than you need than to not have enough. So make sure as you run it across this door frame here, you wanna make sure you figure out how much you need. And then I always like the rule of thumb of about three or four fingers extra, just to make sure we're not having to kind of piecemeal it back together. So now to go ahead and get your containment started, I like to take a piece of tape roll it up here like we used to do back in elementary school, and then just simply stick it up on the door frame. That's gonna give me a base or a foundation to actually hold my plastic. So I'm gonna do the same thing over on this side here. And then simply put, we're just gonna lift our plastic up 
You can either center your plastic, which means you might need to cut off a little extra on both sides, or you can shift it toward one side or another. I like to go a little bit toward the center. It gives me a little bit of wiggle room if something is not lined up exactly. And if you do have the tape come off of the plastic like that. Wow, that just happened. So as we just saw, things don't always go as planned. So this is why having a roll of duct tape around would be helpful. What we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna wanna switch focus to applying blue tape to our door trim here. And as we just saw, the blue tape does not stick very well to the plastic sheeting, but it sticks very well to the door frame. So we're gonna go ahead and protect our door frame. All right. So now, let's pick up where we left off a moment ago. We're gonna make these little rolls of tape that I just talked to you about. We're gonna stick them here to our blue tape. And we're gonna pick up right back where we left off. Like I said, I like to center the plastic so in this case, we should be able to stick quite a bit better. And as you see, our plastic isn't falling, which is always the goal. So now we want to secure the top of the plastic. However, before we do that, we want to come on down. We want to look at both sides, make sure we didn't cut ourselves short. Uh, one pro tip you can actually do is you can take your straight line that you have here, which is gonna be one of the folds of the plastic, and as long as it looks pretty level on a horizontal plane, you should be pretty good to know that you're straight. And in this case, we are good. We have enough on both sides. So let's secure our top piece. We wanna peel off the additional on the edges because duct tape, unlike blue painter's tape, is almost a guarantee to pull off paint. We're gonna come back in with a razor knife and clean it up. So in this case, I've got excess plastic that hangs over the edge here. So what I'm gonna wanna do is I'm gonna wanna cut it to about the center point of the door trim. So in this case, I'm kinda splitting the gap. So you see half the door trim is exposed, half of it is covered up by my plastic. Once you get a little more skilled with this tool, you can actually flip it upside down and just literally run it up like that. Once you get to the top, you can just go ahead and make a cut. And then we'll just continue on down. And then so what I like to do is I'll take a piece of tape and go to the lowest point that I can and actually secure it like so, making sure everything is level and make it nice and taut. And then this will give me a good starting point to make sure that I don't run out of space here when I'm actually lining up and cutting the rest of the plastic. So on this side, we're gonna do about the same thing. As you can see, we do have a little more exposed, but unfortunately, not quite enough. So here's where we're gonna wanna go all the way back down again, tape this lower right side. And again, make sure we try to get it as taut as possible. All right, so just so you guys have an idea of what the purpose of this blue tape is, this blue tape is sort of a sacrificial tape in that what we don't wanna have happen is duct tape directly to the painted door trim because needless to say, when you peel that off, you're gonna peel off all the paint with it and then you're gonna have a larger project on your hands. So. We like to use blue tape when we can to bridge that gap between painted surface and actually sticking to the plastic and not having it fall on you. All 
All right, so once you get to the bottom here, we're gonna wanna roll in our plastic. We wanna line it up, make sure that we've got enough space here. Same thing, this is where using a razor upside down can be beneficial. Now, mind you, if you don't feel comfortable cutting upside down, let alone using a razor knife, you can always use a pair of scissors. You absolutely do not have to use this. I just use it because needless to say, I have plenty of them. There you go, we cut off our excess here. So now what we're gonna do is depending on the flooring that you have here, if you can get blue tape to stick to it, great. If you can't, in this case we have tile floor. So it's kind of a 50-50 as to whether or not, see blue tape is not really sticking very well. So this is an instance where unfortunately, I'm gonna have to use some duct tape to get it to stick to the floor. Now the only saving grace here is that typically tile flooring does not delaminate or anything of that sort. Um, it's not like a finished wood product where you're gonna potentially pull up some of that top coat. But needless to say, if you are weary of the flooring substrate itself, I encourage you to do your homework before just applying something like duct tape to the surface. All right, so next up we have the installation of the zipper. All right, so pro tip, when installing a zipper, you always wanna have the closed end at the bottom. This is just gonna make it very easy for running through extension cords or a dehumidifier drain hose or quite frankly, anything that needs to go inside the containment while keeping the zipper closed as tightly as possible. So in this case, when we install the zipper, we wanna line up the bottom to a height that is gonna be as low as possible, but high enough and still allow us to maintain some seal at the bottom. So in this case, as you look toward the top, you'll see I have some excess up here. So what I like to do is I like to peel the zipper back to what I need and then keeping my foot on the bottom of the zipper, I'll go up as high as I can, keeping it tight leaving the excess here. So you'll notice I'd rather have the excess up off the top than at the bottom. And then what we can do is we can put some tape on the back just to make sure it doesn't stick to the painted surface. But all we're gonna do is we're gonna press on the surface as I use my right hand to pull this paper downward. Keeping it nice and straight, you can remove your foot at this point. And now in the event that it does tear on you, you can always stop, peel back, peel it again, and then get it going. It's always gonna be better when the paper pulls, excuse me, it's always gonna be better when the paper pulls downward together instead of in different strips. You also may have a zipper that has individual strips for each side, which is okay as well. Then we're gonna wanna give it one more press. What you can also do, if you wanted to, you can take an extra piece of paper from the zipper and simply use this to stick to the back side so that way we're not worried about it sticking to the wall if somebody accidentally hits it. Next step, we're gonna come in here. We're gonna use our razor knife or again, scissors if you wanted to, and we're gonna wanna cut an opening. Now what you don't wanna do is you don't wanna cut dead center because if you cut dead center, you're gonna have the plastic is gonna get caught in the zipper and then that's where you're gonna have it to where you're getting lots of snags and rips. So I always like to go either toward the left or toward the right. Now some zippers will come with a special tool that will cut the left and the right side, leaving you a big opening in the middle. In the event you don't have that tool, you can simply run down and as you see, I'm using my fingers to carefully roll the zipper slightly out of the way, leaving my cut slightly off to the left side in this case. And then there you have it. You have a nice opening where we can go through and you should be able to close with ease without snagging. There we go. All right, so next up, we're gonna install our makeup or return air filter. In this case, because we're gonna have our air filtration device or negative air machine down low, we wanna have the air filter as 
far away from that intake from the machine as possible. So in this case, I'm gonna install this somewhere up high here. As you can see, we've offset our zipper to the left to give us some space. So let's go ahead and install this. We are going to need a piece of duct tape here to start. We also want to orient, excuse me, orientate the filter with the airflow going in. That's the direction that we want it to come. In this case, I'm just gonna take a piece of tape right across the top like so. We're gonna set it up again as high as I can, so right around there. And then now all I'm gonna do is go around the whole outside of the filter, make sure it's securely fastened. Now that we've got this secure, we're gonna move on into the inside and cut the opening. All right, so next up, we're gonna go ahead and cut our opening here. Now, we're gonna to wanna to cut just inside of the outside of the filter. So sort of like we did on the door trim, we wanna split the gap. I'm gonna lean my razor knife right up against there, cutting downward, then we're gonna come across. And now we're gonna come down. Now, what we don't wanna do is we do not wanna cut the top. The idea here is to leave this sheet of plastic to be an indication of when we have airflow coming in. As you can see here, and you, you can't feel it because obviously you're on the other end of a camera, but I can, I can feel some airflow coming in here, but what you can see is you can see the plastic drawing inward, indicating there is some airflow or air pressure pushing against this and bringing in fresh air, which is the idea. All right, so moving on to the machinery that's gonna be needed for this project. We've got a professional grade refrigerant dehumidifier, as well as a professional grade HEPA filtered air scrubber. Both of these can be rented from your local hardware store of your choice, so needless to say, sourcing these should not be a problem. All right, so like we were just talking about, we're gonna set this machine up in a negative air fashion. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna lay this machine on its back. The nice thing is this machine is designed to be set up in a multitude of different ways. In this case, we're gonna have our intake on the top side. So we're gonna have our fresh air coming in at the top into the room and eventually it's gonna work its way down, forcing all this particulate over here that we're gonna be creating into this intake and exhausting clean HEPA filtered air outside of our workspace. All right, so now we've got our opening down here. We're gonna go ahead and cut this out. I like to do a pizza pie pattern, personally. Realistically, you can do it however you want, as long as you actually cut through, which we were successful in doing. And then essentially we're gonna stretch it over the mouth of this exhaust port, just like we have here. And now I will cut off these guys. Now you don't have to do this at home. You're welcome to. I do it because I'm OCD. But realistically, we just wanna make sure we do get some tape around the edge just in the event that the compression fit doesn't hold too tight, we at least don't have a loss in pressure. All right, we can just fold the edges. It doesn't need to be perfect realistically. Again, we're just trying to hold our plastic onto here. All right, so some additional options that we have here now that we've set up everything in a negative air fashion. Number one, if you can get your hands on and source some lay flat plastic tubing or really any sort of rigid tubing, what you could do as an alternative to just exhausting this air, albeit clean HEPA filtered air into this space, you can actually connect a tube and duct it to a nearby door or window. Therefore, taking what's going on inside of there, filtering it down 99.97% cleanliness and then exhausting it outdoors. Now, if you do that, you just need to be mindful of if we're blowing air outdoors, we have to bring outdoor air back in. Otherwise, we're gonna put our home under a negative pressure, which is not what we're necessarily looking to do. Now on the topic of ducting, if you can also source some of that ducting, 
you can set up your machine a little bit further away from the containment itself. In this instance, we've got fresh air coming in and near immediately dropping straight down. If we had some tubing, which unfortunately isn't readily available at local hardware stores, we can set this machine a little bit further back, giving us greater filtration within this room, albeit a very small room. All right, so now let's take a look. Now that we've got our machinery running, as you can see, our plastic has peeled back even more. And if I try and close it, it's fighting me and it just pops back open. So as we can see, our negative air machine down here, our intake on top, we've got some nice taut plastic coming in at us and we've got our filtered air coming inside. And the other benefit to leaving this plastic flap here is in the event that we have a power loss and this machinery turns off, this plastic will naturally close. Albeit not a complete seal, it's still a hell of a lot better than not having any protection at all. So now the last step of the containment setup process is gonna be looking around for HVAC or AC diffusers. If there was a bathroom exhaust fan in here, that would also be something I'd wanna seal up. In this case, we only have one smaller HVAC register, so we're gonna go ahead and take some plastic sheeting and some blue tape like you see here, and just go ahead and seal that up. All right, so a little more information on why we're doing what we're doing here is we've got this wall here that's got some discolorations, which I went ahead and showed you guys before. We'll go ahead and take you through it again. And when we take a moisture meter, you don't have to use this one, you can use any run of the mill moisture meter if you wanna check for yourself. We're gonna go ahead and stick it into the wooden baseboard. In this case, I'm gonna hold my reading, and as you can see, on the wood moisture equivalent scale, we've got about a 42, which is pretty much max on this meter. So it does go to show you that we do have some elevated moisture concentrations still in these materials. So now when we take into account the active moisture that we're still finding in this wall, the long history of water damage going on within this wall, and also the possible or suspect microbial growth that we have on the baseboard, this is why we are taking the precautions that we are with the negative air filtration and having the containment barriers in place just because we don't know what's going to be behind this wall. All right, so let's take a moment to talk about safety. PPE, personal protective equipment. Respirator protection. This here is a half mask respirator. This is equipped with P100 filters. This is going to be your greatest line of protection next to a full face mask with these same P100 filters. You can also go with an N95 mask, which is gonna be the white mask that you saw a lot of folks wear during COVID. I prefer the ones that have the exhale valve. It's a little bit easier to breathe with. However, when you compare the two side by side, this is gonna be far superior respirator protection. And now, if you get into a situation like me, if you're one of the viewers out there that have a beard and you go, well, crap, how do I make sure that I'm protecting myself while still not having to shave? You would get into something a little more intense like a PAPR or a powered air purifying respirator. Now I'm not telling you to go out and buy one of these. Quite frankly, if you do have facial hair and you're not attached to it, if I were you, I would shave and I would put on a mask like that. However, given how long it took me to grow this guy out and the fact that I do already own a PAPR, we're gonna go with this half face PAPR. All right, so now that we've got the toilet up, and I hope you guys can hear me okay with this mask on, as you can see, we found a little bit of uh, unexpected collateral damage, if you will. So at this juncture, one of the very possible sources here is gonna be an actual wax ring leak. And if you actually come in close, you can see 
where we don't have a nice even raised section of the wax ring that probably made it with the toilet. We've got a little bit of a recessed area here. We've also got some water around the outside of the wax ring, which looks like through every single flush or you know every number of flushes, you have water that's getting outside of the wax ring, which in essence means it's getting under this tile and working its way into the wall here. So in this case, this is exactly why we plan the way we do with the containment barriers, the filter, especially the zipper, because we don't know how long indeed these, what we call engineering controls are gonna be in place. In this case, I thought it was a simple either toilet line failure or whether or not it was coming from the shower, which is a very common point of failure. Uh, in this case, it looks to be that, again, we've got the wax ring failure, which is much more involved now. We've got flooring material that's gonna be involved. So it's a matter of getting the water up out of here and determining, do we wanna pull this floor up, which by industry standards would be the quote unquote by the book method. This is gonna be category three water that is grossly contaminated water. And because it's actually worked its way into the tile, there's no way for us to A, sufficiently clean under there, but B, to actually test for the successful cleanliness that we would need to, to where I would feel comfortable. So now in situations like this, by, by no means, would you be considered a failure if you said to yourself, you know what, I'm gonna stop, this is clearly larger than this Saturday project that I thought it was gonna be, and go ahead and reach out to a professional. The nice thing is you've got all the engineering controls in place, so you could theoretically clean yourself off, walk away from this, leave everything running, leave this alone until a Monday to have a professional come out, take a look at it, or at the very least to have a phone conversation with a professional and to get their take on it. Yeah, so the video didn't quite go as planned, but I appreciate you guys checking it out. And again, it did make for one heck of an educational piece, if I may say so myself, because as a DIYer, it takes one to know one, there are so many environmental hazards that you can run into when you decide to take on something like mold remediation services. So whether it's category three water like we ran into here or some sort of other electrical or plumbing issue, I mean, there are so many mishaps that can happen through the course of a DIY project. So I'm glad I was able to actually highlight and in essence showcase more of the reality of DIY mold remediation than in a perfect world, a in and out Saturday project. Now, had we not run into these category three conditions, the remainder of the video would have looked a little bit something like this. We would have continued cutting out that drywall behind the toilet or, or where the toilet previously was to about a one and a half to two foot height. I would have done my best to try and stay below the toilet paper holder. However, depending on what we would have found back there, we might have had to come up to that two foot mark regardless. And now once that wall cavity was open, we would have gone through and we would have cleaned everything down, uh, wire brushed some of the corrosion on the metal, done some level of sanding on the surface of the two by fours. There are other alternatives to sanding as well, products that can spray to help lift the uh, the contamination to the surface. We're not gonna quite dive into that aspect here, but just know that there are many options out there for the actual cleaning and treatment process within wall cavities. So now once we would have completed the process within the wall cavity, we would have transitioned over to doing a full on HEPA vacuuming process of the entire bathroom. And we also would have then followed up with a damp wiping or what I call a wet wiping of all of the surfaces within the bathroom. Now you can use something as mild as Dawn dish detergent because in reality, we just need to cut the surface tension of water. So any type of product that could be used as a surfactant to cut that water tension is all that would really be needed. And now once we would have had everything clean, that would be a perfect opportunity to bring back in or to bring in if you didn't do so to begin with a licensed, again, depending on your state, mold assessment contractor to actually review the work that that you did. We call this a post remediation verification where this independent contractor would come out 
inspect the wall cavity, make sure that everything looks copacetic, and also quite possibly test the indoor air quality within this bathroom just to make sure that we're in a good position to now move on to the reconstruction phase. And that about does it. So thank you guys for joining me into the end of this video. And as always, if you want to see more videos like this, please, so that way I can keep throwing my hands up like I always do, please consider subscribing to this channel. At the very least, give me a great big thumbs up. I definitely appreciate those kudos. And if you know anyone that could benefit from a video like this, please feel free to share this video with them. Thank you all once again, and I will see you on the next one.